news of the last month has suggested one thing to a lot of people. Helping the homeless is not as easy as some might think. But is it really this hard? We'll find out this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. What seems clear is when homelessness met Occupy, the game changed here in Madison. A lot of good folks are working to sort things out without losing in the shuffle the important work already being done to eliminate homelessness in Madison. We've got a great panel to talk about the issue this morning, leading off with the mayor of Madison, Paul Soglin, the executive director of Porchlight, Steve Schooler, United Way of Dane County Senior Vice President of Community Impact, Deidre Atkinson, and Tenant Resource Center Executive Director, Brenda Conkle. And thank you all very much for joining me this morning. Clearly, I mean, four really important and very different perspectives on this. So I just would like to go right down the, 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 the row and get each of your description of this, of this issue from your perspective. Paul, what, oh, what, what, is, <laughs> what is homelessness in, in Madison? What is it? It's, it? It depends upon who the homeless person is. Uh, it could be a family that has had continual housing since the, the family, the household came together and suddenly something very abruptly has happened. It could be an individual, most likely it's going to be a male who's going to be over 40, 45, who may or may not have a substance abuse problem, may be a veteran, and in between there's just a whole lot of other people and households that, that come into that uh, uh, challenge of, of not having adequate housing. Meaning what for city resources? Well, meaning uh, a, a lot of things because when we address the issue, uh, it's going to be different in each one of those circumstances and we don't have all of the resources. Um, I mean, we've got housing we, we subsidize, we have programs that we provide for. Um, I think to get into it, we really ought to hear uh, from, from Deidre about what United Way's focus is. We ought to hear from Steve in terms of what mm -hmm. Porchlight's able to do learn the difference between transitional housing, shelter, and moving into permanent housing. And then, you know, Brenda, uh, Brenda is on the ground. She knows the specific individuals, and she knows what their needs are. Way to tee it up. <laughs> Steve? Thank you, Neil. First and foremost, I think it's important to understand that um, most of the homeless persons you do, uh, the community really does not see for a variety of reasons. Uh, approximately 80 to 85 percent of the homeless are people that are down on their luck that either have a serious mental illness or substance abuse issue or a family, oftentimes a family that's fleeing from domestic abuse. They go into the shelters, they access services, they work hard and they work themselves out. Only approximately 10 to 15 percent are, are people that are on the street on a regular basis that are panhandling, that are causing uh, problems um, on the street or problems with the police or anything else. So I think it's very, very important that, that a lot to note, that a lot of the homeless population really are struggling, struggling difficult, with difficult situations, including a lack of wage and a lack of resources, and housing costs that are much higher than those resources are available. In terms of the different housing and shelter components that the mayor talked about, shelters are basically a, a short-term safety net. That's what they're intended to be. That's what they should be. Uh, shelters should try to work hard to provide that safety net to make sure no one freezes to death, to, to make sure that everyone at, that shelter is available for everyone. But the real solution is not the shelters, and it never has been the shelters. The solution is the transitional and permanent housing programs. Transitional housing is, is housing that is uh, temporary housing up to two years. The, the objective is to try to work with that household, work with that family, work with that individual to try and overcome some of the major issues that caused their homelessness in the first place, some of the barriers, and then move them into permanent housing. And of course, permanent housing is that housing where once you get somebody into that housing, you can work with them long term. As the mayor indicated, there are you can't categorize homeless as one person or one particular issue. But we do have group groups, and the more challenging of those homeless are individuals that have serious mental illness and or substance abuse. 
those are the most challenged individuals. For those individuals, what you really need to do is work on providing housing at very, very highly subsidized rates. That means very, very cheap housing in combination with services. And that includes mental health services, if necessary, and includes substance abuse services, as well as case management services just to follow that person. Deidre, if you don't mind, I'm going to save you for last um, and, and ask Brenda, because uh, I, I want to hear if you agree with sort of the definition of, of, of housing and as, you know, as, as homelessness. Mm -hmm. And as the mayor said, you're kind of in the front lines here. Yeah, I think there's no one single description of who is a homeless person. I mean, it's anybody from a newborn baby to somebody who's, you know, 80 years old. Um, and it's, it is people with mental illnesses and alcohol problems. It's a lot of people without mental illnesses and, and alcohol problems. And the sad part about it is, is the people with mental illness and, and alcohol programs, they have programs that can, that can get in, they can get into. There's, there's services that are available for them. If you just lost your job or you, your lease didn't get renewed or something happened to you and you're just sort of a normal person on the street, there isn't a lot of services that are available for you. The outreach workers have their specific silos of people that they work with and this, group has no one that goes out and works with them and and you find a lot of people in the community who have opened up their their hearts and their wallets and are just out there doing things like help making sure people get showers and making sure they can wash their clothes and making sure they get a ride somewhere or making sure they have a sandwich to eat you know and a lot of time and resources are being spent in, on that part of it um, and then the real problem really is the two percent vacancy rate and people can't find housing um, and you know and the shelters are, are the shelters are full I mean, it's not, it's not that the shelters aren't doing their job in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases is that, you know, somebody shows up at the shelter and there's a lottery for the women to get into the shelter and they can't get in that night. Um, plus there's also, you know, couples and there's a whole bunch of people who are just sort of slipping through the cracks as well. You know, if you're not, if you don't fit in the silo of, of, of what people expect, then it's a little bit harder. Just so you. people understand, Brenda, uh, I mean, in terms of the Tenant Resource Center, I think a lot of mm -hmm. people's understanding is that your, your mission is dealing with issues between tenants and landlords. Is it really as much now with homelessness and finding housing? Well, I think most people don't realize that um, I don't get paid to do the stuff I'm doing with homeless folks. Um, the Tenant Resource Center still just deals with tenant landlord issues. Right. Um, but we have found and, and we and have an increasing number of people who are coming in and they have no place to go. They have no housing and so we were sort of forced to They are coming them. to you. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And then, so I, in my, in my spare time, <laughs> um, you know, now that I'm not an older person, I've got a lot of time to, to, to vote to this and I've just been trying to figure out why can't we fix this problem? Right. I mean, it just seems like we sh it, there's a lot of smart people in our community and a lot of people who care and people who are opening up their wallets, but why can't we fix the problem? Deidre, um, this issue has been a part of the Agenda for Change, I think, since the beginning of the uh, Agenda for Change. You yes. know, I've always been working for this for a long time. You've heard the other three perspectives. What, what, what is, what's yours? Uh, totally to add to what it is that they've already said. The, diff the, main, the common ground here is a person is homeless, and that's the main thing, that they don't have a home. So we need to get them into a home. Housing is incredibly important. Now, the issues are different between the families and between the singles. And we know what the uh, families in which we have been concentrating our work, that likely one-third of those families come out of domestic violence. We know that about 50% of them have medical problems that are substantial, and all of them have lost jobs and lost and don't have income to be able to support a, 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 a house and apartment. So uh, we've been particularly interested in housing those families and getting them into stable housing, as particularly Dane County families, as quickly as we can, so that the children don't suffer and the children don't learn how to become chronically homeless as well. All right, when we come back, I want to talk about this uh, group of people on the street that we've been hearing a lot about lately. We'll do that right after this. Whatever they do offer us, we'll have to settle for. We won't have no choice. It's a small thing to do, and obviously the permanent solution is to have enough housing and for people to have jobs and income to afford that housing. My guest this morning, four people right on the front lines of this issue of homelessness. Uh, Mayor Paul Soglin, Steve Schooler, who's the executive director of Porchlight, Deidre Atkinson, who is vice president with United Way of Dane County, and Brenda Conkle, the executive director of the Tenant Resource Center. Okay, what do we need to know about this, this group of people that's getting a lot of attention? And it is, it is sort of that, that conflict between homelessness and Occupy that I think a lot of people are confused about. What, what do we need to know about this? Well, let me uh, describe one thing that's underway right now. 
a couple of members of the city council and myself have introduced a resolution with the goal of providing somewhere around 40 to 50 uh, units of single residency uh, in the next year or two. But to do that, there's certain things that have to be done and our partners and the city have to work together. And, and this is the challenge. Uh, it's, you can't simply find a site, construct the units, and open the doors. Um, we've got the issue of mental illness and substance abuse. My guess is of the 60 to 80 uh, single men that we see frequently on one end of State Street to the other, perhaps 10 to 12 are, uh, have, have, have problems that are so severe that they need constant attention. There's another group that needs case management uh, and will be able to function very well if they had the shelter, the permanent housing we're talking about. The challenge is twofold. One is getting our partners the resources they need to address uh, the therapy, the advice, making sure that medications are taken. And then the second one is a recognition that the city of Madison is a defined geographic area and it alone cannot afford the cost of providing the subsidized housing. We need help. Are we doing a disservice by connecting the, uh, this, this Occupy group and homelessness? I mean, do people understand that or is there value in looking at this together? I think there's a big misunderstanding. All the people staying at Occupy are homeless. Um, some people think they're, you know, activists because they're out there and they're, they're well-spoken and they have some nice tents that people donated to them and they think that it's just young kids who are activists who went out there and are camping. These are people who are literally homeless on the streets. And I, you know, <clears throat> there some of them are on waiting lists that it's, you know, it's almost like the waiting list group. They're, uh, where they're waiting to get into housing somewhere. And that's a part of the big, you know, big part of the problem. Also, I think that, um, as they, they get mar further and further marginalized every single time they have to move and every time you know this incident with the county is just was, was atrocious I mean they just picked them up and dropped them off out on a reservation out in the in the country I mean it just it, it, it it's just so dehumanizing and and there's no conversation going on nobody's going out there and asking and talking to the people that are actually there and, and I think they're just Can I jump in really at this alienated. point Brenda because one of the things that someone has to do and, and I'm going to you know, see that the city takes the lead on this, is we have to go out and we have to identify every single homeless individual, mm -hmm. every single homeless family, and determine exactly where they're at and everything related to their health. I'm talking their physical health, their mental health, their access to transportation, um, their, their access to food, and also uh, what they may need in regards to job training or Can becoming. we do that? It's a small enough number that we can do that. No, it's not a small enough number. Uh, we had a meeting the other day and I think there was general agreement that we're talking in terms of households and individuals, perhaps 300 households, uh, excuse me, 300 uh, um, individuals? households, which okay. may mean up to 400 individuals. Uh, uh, but we have to do and that. And it has to be done individually, and you, you have to talk to each person as if they're a human being, and you've got to find out what they want to need, and you've got to build trust. Because there's a lot of people who just will not trust anybody who's coming to talk to them, because every time somebody comes to talk to them, it's like they're the specimen that's being examined and poked and prodded, and then nothing happens, and so why should they waste their time? Or someone says, here, call this public health nurse. Well, they call the public health nurse, and they say, who's your primary doctor? I don't have one. Well, we can't help you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it just seems like there's this, like, somehow the people who need the help are not getting through the, sy the system. There needs to be some barriers that are broken All right, I, I've, got a, I've, I've got a question here. You mentioned 40 to 50 units of housing. You're going right. to open 50 units of housing on Monday. That's, that's correct. It's already filled. Okay, it is mm -hmm. already filled. Okay, so but, this is, we, need, but, we need 40 to 50 more. Right, exactly. And let me talk a little bit about the project and how that worked and, and why it's a little bit more difficult than just you know, creating some housing units. It took us about three to four years to raise the four million dollars that it's going to cost to make these housing units work and occupiable. 
And a good portion of that money is privately funded. Only a small portion is actually public funding, about less than a quarter. And the way in which you need to make it work is thus. You need, first of all, the housing units to be very affordable. That means they have to work at a very, very efficient level. For example, solar panels so that we can sell electricity to MG&E to help pay the utility costs. They have to be constructed or remodeled in such a way so that you have um, a, 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 a construction and a project so that people, that they're easily maintain maintainable. All in all, you have to be able to essentially make these units work for $375 a month, including utilities. Okay, that's really cheap, and it's really hard to make it work. You can, but it's hard. The other piece, so that's the piece of having the housing. The other piece, and the mayor mentioned this, is the services piece, and that's the case management, that's the therapy services that these folks need, and you have to identify. Some don't need much, some need mental health services, some need uh, alcohol and, and substance abuse services, and you've got to feed that into that 300 to 375 dollars a month, and and oftentimes what you need is some sort of subsidy from government, but it, but if you can actually build the units like we did, um, you can actually make it work with a very very minor subsidy, okay, and actually have the case management services attached. The therapy services and and the ALDA services are the additional piece that's hard to get. All right, we're going to come back and. Talk more about the homelessness issue with uh, this panel right after this. <clears throat> We're back. We're talking about homelessness. And before the break, as Steve Schooler was talking about his new um, uh, facility, Porchlight's new facility, we were showing pictures on the screen, and they were of the 800 block of State Street. Uh, I'm sorry, of East Washington Avenue, which is uh, a temporary location that the county has chosen. Uh, for temporary housing through the end of March, I believe, and we don't want people to think that it, that it was the, that it was the same thing. Um, all right, I'm still. I, I want to get. I want to get to this um, alcohol and drug issue because um, I, I know that it's really, really important. Brenda, if they go out, to, if they go out to the site where people are, there, there's no question but that there will be some alcohol, drug, mental illness issues there. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Definitely. this is. And, and let's yeah. start the conversation now. Yeah. This way. Not everyone who is homeless has these problems. Exactly. We've got to be clear about that. Yeah. The other thing is that there are people who are homeless who have these problems, and we have to address those issues. That's one of the reasons why there's got to be the linkages that, that Steve's mentioned. It's not just a question of creating the, 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 the units. The other thing we have to understand is something that the United Way is really focused on, Brenda is, keeps raising, which is the family units, particularly women and children, and where there's other issues there related to health, related to being the victims of abuse, and, and this is something uh, which, which needs more. more. So we talk about all of these numbers so far, Deidre. How many of these people are not connected to United Way in some how, to United Way agencies in some way now? Well, between Porchlight, YWCA, Road Home, and Salvation Army, we have 549 families in family units. We are doing this program called Housing First, where we try to get that family into housing immediately because the complex problems that have occurred for that family that have put them into a homeless situation are not going to be solved overnight, and they need the case management services. But they really can't accept the case management services or accept what's working until they get stable housed so we have to do that's why we call it housing first and then we add the case management services Steve's going exactly the right direction for the singles and in, in this uh, new facility that he's uh, built on Nicosa Road where we're going to uh, uh, house these folks and then we're going to provide the case management services to help them keep moving in a forward direction mm -hmm. So that's important to note is that these are for singles, is, is, is porch that's lights correction. <clears throat> we do family units, but this particular development was for singles because we identified a huge need in this community for, for single, for housing, for singles. Steve and Porchlight were part of breakthrough funding that we did in 2006, starting with um, families on Housing First. And what we learned from that experience, and it continues to grow, is that Housing First is twice as effective in terms of outcomes for the individuals. 80% are stably housed after two 
two years versus 37 percent who are treated through shelter alone. And the interesting thing here is that permanent solutions for these folks are half the price of what we are doing in managing homelessness by moving them from shelter to shelter or park to park and the extended uh, expenses that come with that. We don't have a lot of time left I, and I'm, I'm going to get back to you in just a second Brenda mm -hmm. but Paul if you can just bring in bring in the the panhandling issue the, the sort of sort of the people on state street who who seem rather aimless i mean again are we confusing the issue by by lumping this into they, the homeless they problem? are a small portion of the problem in terms of numbers of individuals they are a significant part of the problem in two regards one they are very expensive in terms of police and fire department contact, in terms of conveyances, in terms of detox, in terms of the hospitals. Secondly, they unfortunately become the face of the homeless so that when we go to try and get long-term permanent solutions to site facilities, they in turn are the image which makes it very difficult for neighborhoods to accept the kinds of permanent housing solutions we're looking at. Three people died this summer. I can't get medical examiner verification. Two of them were men who drank excessively through the heat wave during the evenings, did not use the cooling centers that we opened, mm -hmm. and died of he dehydration. The third drunk took a swim in Lake Mendota and drowned. We got, one, we got a minute left, Brenda. Well, I think Housing First is absolutely critical and that's part of what Occupy is doing. They're, they're providing a base camp for people so when they don't get into the shelter that night or their 60 days is up or whatever, they can come there. In the summer, we had about 50 regular people who stayed out at the, out at the campgrounds um, and 17 of them were able to find housing. It's that getting the people stabilized so they have like a permanent basis so that they can start to begin to address the other issues. When they're moving all around the city every night, it doesn't work. I, wanna, I, I just want to answer the question, anybody have my, uh, how can they help? If people want to help, can I just tell them to call the three of you, <laughs> that sure. each one each sure. one of the three of you could yeah. Yeah. could give people ideas yeah. about, about, about or how or they email. could help. Or email. Yep. Yep. Or call yep. 211. And, and the area you know, where I have focused, and I'm, I'm getting this bad reputation, <laughs> but is really we've got to get to this small population that is so troubled. Okay, okay. Thank you all very much. We're going to come back and wrap it up right after this. My thanks to the mayor, Steve, Deidre, and Brenda for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. We'll see you next Sunday on For the Record.